What's up, YouTube? It is your boy, JB, and I'm here tonight with the review for Pose Season 2, episode number 4, and the episode was titled, um, Never Knew Love Like This. So, you guys, without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and just get into the video. This was a good episode. It was an emotional episode, and it also provided some talking points for a lot of people to just talk about. So, you guys, let's go ahead and just jump right into the video. All right, so the episode opened, they are at the ball, and the category for the ball was lofting, you know, um, so I think it was mostly for the, like, the guys, you know, like the, uh, Preto said, the, you know, the tops, the trades, uh, some other, some other ones he named off, so, you know, they doing their thing, and the, and the whole thing with, the whole thing with the lofting was that since Madonna has now made voguing the it thing what they're doing is they're taking it back and they putting a spin on it. So, um, you know, as Praytel is getting ready to wrap up the ball, you know, he's like, does anybody else want to come up here and contend with this? And it got quiet for a minute. So then Candy shows up and, you know, he's like, I know this. He, he was like, really, bitch. And, you know, she had something on that looked like, you know, if you guys watch Power Rangers back in the 90s, when Rita's, um, her, 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 um, her, her, her dress had the little breath breast plates that pointed out that's what she kind of looked like so then you know she come in and start doing her thing and looking like she doing ymca and stuff like that and i'm like okay candy and again i'm like candy like really i admire her tenacity her spunk i admire i really do admire that about her that you know despite what pray tell does candy is not gonna give up like she says she gonna win something god damn it she don't if it if she don't win nothing well if she doesn't try how will she know that she's not good at it? So I definitely have to admire her, her drive, her spunk, her tenacity. Again, like I said, I just have to, I have to admire that. And you know, pray tell them once he, you know, like he always does. He reads her, you know, he asked the judges, judges score please. One judge gave her a five. It was five, five, zero, six, and a five. I'm like, damn. I'm like, I mean, I know it wasn't that good, but damn, do y'all really have to be harsh to the girl like that? Like. So then, you know, Candy reads him back. And she's like, you know, um, she's like, you know, just like Madonna, I got heart. I got talent. And God damn it, I'm going to be a star. And I'm like, that is the attitude that you should have. Like, fuck what people say. You sh if you believe in it in your head, you can make it happen. I mean, hell, look at, some of these, look at some of these rappers today who can't even fucking rap. Like, Blueface. Bust down Tatiana. I listened to that song uh, last week. Cause I, I mean, I've heard it before in passing. But actually, to sit there and listen to that whole fucking song, and that little man, that little homie is off beat the whole song. I'm like, really? This what the kids listen to today? Is that bullshit, man? Y'all can absolutely 100% keep that shit. I'm good with you know the shit from the early 2000s, the 90s. I'm good with all the old school music. Y'all can keep that. The new school music, y'all can definitely keep that. Like, please keep that shit. Um. So then we see, um, you know, Blanc and Praytel, they at the hospital. And, you know, they just talking, you know, um, they're talking about, you know, how, again, Madonna has made Vogue the it thing right now. So Blanc is like, so how about we do, you know, we should do the AIDS cabaret and uh, the AIDS cabaret show. And with this, you know, she wants to bring awareness to, you know, um, she wants to bring awareness to AIDS, but also, you know, just have this, um, you know, this cabaret showcase. So then, you know, we see them there talking to Nurse Judy. And um, they tell Judy, like, why don't you and your girlfriend come to, you know, the balls? And Judy's like, you know, when uh, by the time y'all getting started with the balls, me and Bay, we in the bed and we knocked out. So I don't really see that happening. So then, you know, um, Blanc, I'm not Blanca, but Nurse Judy is telling uh, Pray Tell about Blanca's T-cells, how since she's been on AZT, that her T-cells have gone up. And Pray Tell says, so what, is this supposed to be another month, one of them interventions? And we find out that Pray Tell is not taking AZT at all. So, Pray Tell is just, you know, playing playing Russian roulette. He's gambling with his health. And, you know, he's like, my T-cell count hasn't dropped any lower. And, you know, um, Judy is like, but it's not getting any better either. 
and we need like you really need to take this medicine to save your life and you know she was like and um blanca told me about those those um holistic you know treatments that those um holistic treatments that you did and he was like oh so she did tell oh so she told you that he's like okay so then we see where you know he had he was at blanca's house maybe a week ago and he was you know melting some he was boiling some butter and some mineral oil and they said that that would help it i'm like butter and mineral oil even just the butter alone you looking at high cholesterol and clogging your motherfucking artery so you're not doing anything but really killing yourself even faster like i don't know how pray didn't see that so then you know uh he was like well blanca should have kept her mother basically he was like blanca should have kept her fucking mouth closed and i told you shit that has to do with me like i got this leave me the fuck alone so pray tell does get up and he leaves out and i'm like pray tell you might want to listen to them like I was watching um, Forrest Rock's video a few weeks ago when the, with the last uh, Pose video, and she was talking about how some of her, some of the other rock stars were telling her about how bad AZT was for people in the '90s. So, you know, it was a it was like a I guess almost like a blessing and a, a curse, like a catch twenty two. I don't know anything about AZT. I don't know anything about AIDS in the '90s because at this I think we're in 1990. So in 1990, I was literally only one years old. So I don't really know anything about it. The only thing that I remember from the 90s about the AIDS epidemic was, um, and this, and it, actually that was like really, really real. Like that's when reality TV was at its beginning and it was super real. Was with the real world with Pedro, who later died. If he, I don't know if Pedro died after filming or if he died a few years after the show. But nonetheless, Pedro did pass away. And again, this was all like before, you know, we got to modern science where we are today, where people can live with AIDS and HIV. Man, it's just crazy. Thinking about where we where things were in the 90s, as opposed to where we are today. You have people who are living and functioning with the disease. All right, you guys. So then we have Pray Tell. So he Pray Tell, he is meeting up with the Masters of Ceremony. So they're talking about what to do with the ball. So, you know, they're talking about how they need to have you know, people pay their dues and their donations because those trophies are not free. Um, they're talking about how the moment of silence is, is going too long because, at, and, and, and remember, in previous episodes, there have been multiple people that have been dying of AIDS. So I'm pretty sure that if they're giving a moment of silence for everybody who's passed away, that moment of silence is running a hell along. And, um... They're talking about, you know, okay, so since Madonna, you know, she's the, the craze right now, we got to figure something out with that. And, you know, um, one of the guys said, the, you know, so what the kids say, how about we do like, you know, um, some lip syncing, which we all know today is pretty much karaoke. And, you know, um, Pertel's like, you know, well, we, get, we just need to be prepared since all the eyes are on the community, but he's not here for the lip syncing. Like, if the girls want, if the kids want to do that, why don't they go down there to the gay bars? with the white boys that's wearing the blue jeans and do and do that shit there. And then, you know, Candy is in the background and she's listening to them. And Candy's like, well, you know, I have an idea. So Candy does agree with doing the lip sync. You know, she was like, you can create a category for that. So then, you know, um, Pray Tell again, not here for that shit. So, um, you know, as Candy's getting ready to leave, I don't know if she grabbed a knife or if she grabbed a spoon or whatever, but she grabbed something and she put it to pray tell like this. It's like, bitch, what you gonna do? You gonna stab me in front of these, in, in broad daylight in front of all these motherfucking people? You that bad? Oh, you that bad, huh? So Candy, you know, leaves and then she starts throwing shit at him. I'm like, well, damn. <coughs> it's crazy. Like, hmm. I mean, I, I I I I don't know what to say. I really don't. Like I feel like I I I, I kind of guess I get where Pretel comes from sometimes, and I don't get where he comes from. But I also get where I definitely get Candy. You know, Candy just wants to be seen. She wants to be. I don't know. If she, I don't, I'm not gonna say seen in that sense. I think what it is, she wants people to see her for who she is and accept her for who she is. As a trans woman, and you know, she want, like I said, she wants to be a star. She wants people to acknowledge her, accept her, see her talents, and all that stuff. So I get where she's coming from in that aspect. Um, and I also get where Pray Tell is coming from 
if you're not talented, then I can't, I don't want to lie to you and tell you, oh, you're doing good. You did this good. And then you go to somebody else and they tell you that was, that was a crock of bullshit. So it's, I get, I can see both sides, but pray tell when it comes down to him, it's almost as if he is just attacking her, attacking her, attacking her instead of trying to be like, um, you know, constructive criticism, basically. So then we are at the ball and the category is higher than heaven. So I don't really know who the people were that were in the walking in the ball because they didn't. I thought one of them was a legend, but I'm looking, I'm like, that's not her. So one of them looked, had an intergalactic look. And then another girl had a bird cage. I'm like, oh, I, I. and Pertel was like, what you gonna, how you going to uh, the, get the uh, trophy? You ain't got no hands. I'm like, oh, my God. So um, then we see Angel. Angel comes up to Blanca and she tells her to come, you know, come with her. So then she goes back um, to the back and Lulu's back there crying. And she's talking about how she hasn't saw Candy. And, you know, how Candy has missed her last two shifts at the club. So then Lulu tells um, Blanca that, you know, Candy has been turning tricks at the at the hotel. So, you know, she asked her, like, well, she's like, have you been down to the hotel? Uh, Blanca asked her, have you been to the hotel? She's like, no. She's like, will you come with me? So then we see her and um, Blanca, they go to the hotel room. So the manager of the hotel, they, you know, they ask him, have he seen Candy? He says, I see a lot of girls. So Blanca, not um, Blanca, but uh, Lulu shows him a picture and then, you know, she remembers that Candy says that, um, you know, well, actually, Blanca says, tell him about the room. So, you know, Lulu tells him, well, she likes room 44 because she says it has a vanity in there. She says, is anybody in room 44? And then they notice that the key is missing. So Blanca says, well, somebody's obviously in that room. Can we just go down there and knock and see if they're still there? He says, fuck that and fuck no. I was like, well, damn. So if there's a dead bitch in your room... You don't give a fuck? Okay. Remember that when the police come, you said, fuck that and fuck no. Like, really? Fuck that and fuck no? Fuck that and fuck no. Like, how cold and heartless can you be? Like, they're looking for their sister or friend, whatever you want to say, however you want to say it. Like, that was just cold and cold as fuck. So once he said that, you know, Blanca's like, well, here's my number. If you do see her or hear anything, give me a call. So then we see them at the house and, you know, Blanca has flyers and she wants to post the flyers around, you know, and Poppy's like, he want to go out and help. She's like, no, Poppy, you stay here. Okay. So that way, if she does come, well, not if she comes back, if he was, he was on phone duty. So if someone calls, he answers the phone. So he's like, okay, I'm on phone duty. So then the phone does ring. And he says, Ma, it's for you. I'm like, I was, I knew what it was at, when he said, when the way he said it and when he said it. I'm like, it's not going to be good. I'm like, that is so not going to be good news. And lo and behold, it was not good news. Because then we hear a knock at the door and we hear the doorbell ringing and it's Lulu. So Lulu comes in and she asks Blanca, like, have you heard anything? And she's like, let's wait until Electra gets here. And she's like, no, Blanca, tell me, like, what's up? And she tells her, Candy is dead. And Lulu lost it. Now, I didn't lose it at that point. I'm like, okay, we cool. I'm like, be strong, be strong, be strong, be strong, be strong. So, um, yeah, Lulu's dead. I mean, not Lulu, but Candy's dead, my bad. All right, so then we do have Electra there and Angel's there as well. So, you know, um, Lulu asked, like, do they know what happened? And she was like, they don't. And she was, uh, well, she says, do they know what happened? So they don't really know what happened, but uh, what happened, how Blanca was come to, came to found out was because once they did leave, the manager of the hotel, he became curious. So then the maid went to go clean the room. And when she was cleaning the room, she saw, I think, I thought, I think there was a bloody robe. And then she opened the closet and there was candy dead. And that was the moment when I started to lose it. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, Candy is really fucking dead. So, um, you know, what was I? What am I saying? So, yeah. So, then, um, yeah, Lulu asks, do they know who did it? And Blanca says no. But the police are looking to find out who did it. And, you know, Electra's like, they don't give a fuck. Like, that was a trans, trans, well, she said transsexual, which we now call transgender. So, that's a transsexual woman. 
they don't give a fuck. Like, they gonna close the case and move on with their fucking lives. And angels like that is fucked up, which that is completely fucked up. That's a, he, I don't give a fuck how y'all feel, about, how people feel about the trans community, the gay community, lesbians, um, the bisexual community. I don't give a, the, the black community, any community. I don't give a fuck how you feel about people and their beliefs, their religion, whatever. I don't give a fuck how you feel about it. Human life is human life. At the end of the day, we all are human. Like, do we? Ha do you not have any compassion, any empathy? Do you not have any common decency? Like, a, a person has been murdered, and just because you didn't agree with her lifestyle, you're gonna be like, oh, fuck it. We don't give a fuck. Close the case, lock the, you know, close the case. It's a done deal. Like, that is bullshit. That is complete fucking bullshit. And that made me, and watching this episode, it made me think about um, the murders that have, is, so um, in Dallas, within the last month, back in May and June, I believe it was, was not the last month, but within the last few months, there have been two murders of transgender women. Um, the one, um, Malaysia Booker, that was murdered here. And I'm pretty sure everybody saw that viral video where she was getting beat up by those guys. And the thing that bothered me with that video was that people just stood around and watched her get beat up. And then not even two weeks later, she was murdered. Now, I did read that they have arrested someone in her murder. And then I found out, and then I also knew that after her murder, there was another young lady that was murdered. And her name, I, I can't pronounce her name, you guys, and I don't really want to butcher it. Her name is spelled C-H-Y-N-A-L, Lindsay. And she was actually the third woman to be murdered. And I believe that they um, have tied this guy that they, mur they, they uh, have, um, has been, that was responsible for Malaysia Booker's murder. I think they've tied him to another murder that happened last October, which I, I didn't even know about. And it just goes to show you, even to this day, transgender women and men, mostly women, are being murdered by straight men like that's the worst part like like i don't understand that shit if you are ashamed of what you do don't fucking do it like i i, I can't even I, I just don't understand that shit because it's it's uh it's a trend when it comes to transgender women <coughs> being murdered they're being murdered by supposed straight men who are sleeping with you know transgender women but then when they start to get, you know, people start to figure shit out, they be like, oh, shit, I can't be, a, I can't be um, attached to being gay, being bi, being whatever they are, you know, whatever they're going to be classified. I got to keep up this straight vibe, uh, you know, for as long as I can. But then, you know, you go and kill somebody behind your bruised ass ego, your fragile masculinity. Like, that shit is stupid as fuck, to be quite honest with you. Like, um... There's a case that happened in my hometown of Tyler, Texas, where there was a girl who had a boyfriend. Supposedly, he didn't know that she was a transgender for the longest time, and he murdered her. I'm going to have to look that case up. Actually, I'm about to do that right now. Because that case was, that case kind of was stupid and pissed me off about him. Because it came, because it, it was starting to come to light about, you know, what he was really doing. So give me just a second, you guys, because I'm actually about to look this up. I found it. Well, it was on. It's on People.com. I know it was a kind of a big story. I, I thought it was just big in my hometown. Okay, so it says, Texas college football player charged with murder of transgender woman. Transgendered woman. There was an ongoing sexual relationship between the victim and the suspect police say. And she was a pretty girl. The 911 call to Tyler, Texas police early morning of January 26th first reported a car crash and then a witness nearby told police he'd heard gunshots. Officers responding to the scene at 2.26 a.m. discovered a red Toyota Camry that had been jumped, that had jumped the curb just shy of hitting a utility pole. 
the lone person inside the driver's seat appeared to be female. The victim had been shot several times, according to a criminal affidavit. And it was the shots, Officer Don Martin tells people, that caused the victim to lose control of the car. Declared dead at the scene was Tyrone Ty Lee Underwood. Why did they have to do that? And they got it in, they got Ty in quotes. Why can't y'all just call her by her name? She was 24, a transgender woman. On Monday, police arrested Carlton Ray Champion, Jr., 21, a college football player who they say had an ongoing relationship with Underwood for Underwood's um, murder. In their investigation, police interviewed Champion's father, Carlton Champion Sr., who stated that he heard Carlton Jr. was meeting the victim and thought the victim was a female. Officer Nathan Elliott wrote in the arrest affidavit, according to Champion Sr., Carlton was supposed to get some type of sexual favor from the victim, but realized the victim was a male. Okay, the daddy is ignorant as fuck too. Police say otherwise. A relationship between the two had been ongoing for several weeks. Martin tells people all indications are that both parties, the suspect as well as the victim, knew the gender of each prior to the shooting. There was no hate, there's no hate crime, Martin says. Evidence that was located indicated that they both they, they were both aware through more than a friend through more than a friendship relationship what they were getting into. Oh, okay. They both were oh, they both were aware of what they were getting. Okay. It was he says it was it was, he says, a sexual relationship. Underwood died according to the arrest affidavit after arguing with Champion on social media about whether Champion was seeing someone else. How and where the gunshots were fired is under investigation, police says. Although police have located no witnesses who okay, although police have located no witnesses who saw anyone running from the car. The indications by the bullet holes in the vehicle and the victim indicate that more than likely at some point in time, Champion was in the vehicle versus versus not a drive-by shooting, says Officer Martin. We definitely know for sure that the shots were fired from outside the vehicle, he says, but possibly inside as well. Investigators were led to Champion after Underwood's roommate told them Underwood had been dating a man named Carlton for the past couple of weeks. A police department employee who worked with Underwood recalled that Underwood had talked about dating a football player at, at Texas College in Tyler. All right, you guys. So you guys kind of get the gist of it because this is pretty long. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to go any deeper. But, yeah, it's just crazy. Like, I think I just I mean, like I said, it's that fragile masculinity. And, you know, don't want people to think don't want people to look at you as gay by. Like, be who you are. Don't be a... I mean, this... It's just bullshit, to be quite honest with you. It's, it's literally bullshit. Um, so, okay. So, back to the show. So, now what they have to do is they have to figure out a way to get the body. Because, unfortunately, none of them are family of Candy's. So, you know, um, Electra tells um, Angel, I need you to reach out to her parents. She's like, okay, I got that. And she says, me and um, Blanca... We're going to go try to figure out what to do about the body. So then we see Blanca and Judy. They are at the morgue and they're talking to a guy who works there who happens to be gay. So Judy appeals to him like, hey, like your lover, what would happen if he died just unexpectedly? And his family told you you had no rights to the man that you love. How would you feel? So with Judy tugging at his heartstrings, he says, OK. And she says, if anything happens, I'll take the blame for it. Like, I'm cool with that. So he gives her a paper. He tells her, write down the um, funeral home that you want the body to go to, and I'll get it there. And I'm like, cool. That was nice. All right, so then we got Angel, Blanca, and Electra. They at the funeral home, and they get ready to view the body. So they go in there to view the body, and oh my God. I look, when they showed Candy, I'm like, what the fuck is that ugly ass wig on her head? I was looking at the wig. I was looking at the makeup, but mostly that wig. Cause that wig was just she was laying and that wig was just sitting if you got you guys remember you know you guys know that meme where the woman is in the um in the church and she passes out and her wig falls off her head that's how candy's wig looked to me so you know um they fix candy up they take the wig off and they just fix her makeup fix her makeup and then we do see it and candy does look 10 times better 
a hundred times better, a thousand times better. So then Angel says that, you know, basically her mom and dad would not acknowledge their daughter. So, you know, Angel just feels bad about that and the fact that Lulu is not there. And Blanca's like, you know, don't blame yourself. Like, um, Lulu is grieving and, you know, people deal with grief in different ways. So just don't, don't be too down on yourself about that. So, um, we see Pray Tell. Pray Tell gets up and he gives the eulogy and I love what he said. And, you know, it's just something that I, I always think about when it comes to funerals. Like, we are, you know, and especially if it's somebody that dies unexpectedly, like, you say all these good things about them, you, you remember them, you, you laugh, you have a good time, but it's just like, we're doing all of this, but that person is dead and gone. And, you know, like I said, we're lifting them up. We are praising them. We, you know, we, you know, we're saying the good things about them. We're remembering the good times about them, you know, give people and I think I'm about it, what show it was, but it was another show recently where we should um, give our people their roses while they're here. Like say the good things about them now. Don't wait until their funeral to say all the good, positive things about them. Uplift people now. Say what you need to say. So that way when they go, when they are not here, they can take that with them knowing, hey, I meant this to that person. You know, I touched this person in X, Y, Z way. You know, just give them their roses while they're here on earth. Um, so then Pray Tell gives a moment of silence. So when he goes down and sits to sit, we hear Candy's voice. And then Candy says, I forgive you. He was like, what? She says, I forgive you. She says, I was a forgiving person. So then, you know, she they sit down and she sits down and they have a conversation. And she decides to ask him, like, pray tell, like, why would you always such an asshole to me? And the gist of it is, pray tell was an asshole because of who Candy is, how outspoken she was, how free she was with who she is. And, you know, he just, I, ultimately, it's, it's uh, ultimately, he admired who she is because he, I guess, deep down is kind of afraid to be who he is, which I'm like, that that's interesting. But basically, he just admired who she was. So then, um, you know, we see Angel. Angel goes up to the beat of body. Angel is having a hard ass time with it. And she's just like, you know, why couldn't it just have been me? So then, you know, Candy comes to her and talks to her. And Candy tells her, hey, let this be a lesson to you. Use this as a teaching moment. Like, she's like, I don't want to see you down there on those piers. And Angel's like, I haven't been down there in a minute. She's like, I know, but you still have that in your back pocket. And the reason why you have that in your back pocket is because you're afraid of this modeling thing. She's like, don't let that get you down. She says, you are going to be the one to make a way for our kind in the modeling world. So, yes, I don't want to see your ass on that fucking pier. Because if you, I see you on there, I'm going to haunt the hell out of your ass. And, um, yeah. And, she's, and then she does tell her, she says, you know what, Angel? Thank you for reaching out to my parents. You did right by me, sis. So then, you know, Angel leaves. And as she's leaving, she runs into Lulu, who's sitting out in the, um, you know, sitting out in the waiting area. And she goes up to um, Lulu, and Lulu is just like, you know, I'm not, she's like, do you want to go in there and say goodbye? And she's like, I don't know. She's like, I'm not ready. I'm, I'm afraid. And I like that Angel told her, you know, um, to have to remember the good times with her, basically. And she's like, oh, right now, all I can think about is the bad memories. Well, she, you, I, the good should outweigh the bad. Yes, I know, I know Lulu probably blames herself. For what happened to Candy, but Candy was a grown woman, and Candy knew what she was getting herself into. So, um, no one is to blame. I'm, I'm not even gonna blame. I'm not even gonna blame Candy in this situation. I'm definitely not gonna blame her. The person that I'm gonna blame is the person who killed her. That's who I blame. I'm not gonna blame Candy at all. I think Candy could have made smarter decisions, wiser decisions. So, like I said, I'm just not gonna blame her per se. Because I, I don't want to blame the victim. Definitely don't want to do that. Um, so, you know, um, uh, uh, Angel tells her you, you, you won't be able to forgive yourself if you don't say goodbye to her. Which I definitely agree with that. I 100% absolutely agree with that. 
this actually reminds me of my mom's funeral. You know, um, I told I don't know if I've told you guys, which I probably have said that I'm adopted within my family. So my mom that died was actually my um, aunt, my great aunt. And, you know, my birth mother uh, is her niece, which that was the obvious one, right? So, like I said, so just back to that story. So when my mom passed away, um, I reached out to my birth mother. At first, she didn't contact me. She didn't, she didn't respond to my text. And my cousin had to tell her to reach out to me. And she reached out to me and I told her what happened. Well, I guess my cousin had told her what happened. And she reached out to me. And, you know, she told me she was going to come to the funeral. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And, you know, the day of the funeral, or the day before, I can't remember which one exactly, she texted me and she told me she wasn't going to be able to make it. And I told her, you know what, that's okay. Which it was, it was okay with me. I, I wasn't hurt one way or the other. And, you know, I told her, that's okay. If you can't make it, I completely understand, you know. Um, which I did, I understood, because... There's a there's a, a bad history between the three of between my birth mother, my adopt my mom, and myself. There's a bad history between us within the last few years. We got actually it's been a bad history since I found out about her, but it got worse after I turned eighteen and got older. You know, eighteen through twenty eighteen through twenty five is when we had a big, big rough patch. Um, and I'm not gonna go too deep into it because that's nobody's business but my family's and mine So I'm just not gonna go deep into it, but we went through a rough patch and you know my um, aunt She came to the funeral one of my aunt, my mom my birth mother's sister came to the funeral and she pulled me to the side And you know, she was she, she was checking on me and she told me she said Jerome. I'm so mad at your mama Well, she didn't say my mom. She said her mom, her sister her name and I'm not gonna say my mother's name my birth mother's name out of respect for her, if anybody in my family, you know, finds my channel, I don't want to say, which y'all, I mean, y'all know what the hell I'm talking about. But, uh, she, you know, she just said, I'm just mad at her. And I said, I had to ask her, I'm like, why are you mad at her? She's like, I'm mad at her because she didn't come to the funeral after all that. And I, I'm going to say my, my mom's name. Her name is Geraldine. She's like, after all that Angel did for her, the least she could have did was came and said goodbye. And I told her, my aunt, I said, Lisa, I'm not worried about it. I'm like, that's something that she has to live with, not me. She has to live with that. I said to her, I said, you're here, right? She said, yeah. You said goodbye. She said, I did. I said, and where was I? I was front and center at my mom's casket, listening to my cousin give her eulogy. And I said, that's all I, die. That's all I care about. Only thing that I knew in my heart of hearts was that I was going to say, my final goodbyes to the woman that raised me from day one when I was born. So there was no, there was nothing in this world that was going to stop me from saying goodbye to my mother because she was that my mother. She, like I said, the day I was born, she came to the hospital from work and she knew from jump that I was her child and she took, she took me in as her kid. So I knew without a doubt that I had to say goodbye. And I, I, I like I said, I just love the fact that that's what Lulu, um, um, Angel was saying to Lulu. Go in there, say your goodbyes. Because if you don't, you will, however, regret not saying goodbye to someone who meant something to you. So I love that message. So they go in there and they say, you know, Lulu says her goodbyes. And then she looks down and she says, you thieving bitch. You stole my brooch. And then she's taking the, she's taking the, her brooch off and her she's taking her brooch off. She's taking her gloves off. They're like, is she taking her shit off? And they're like, yep, she's taking her shit off. So they go grab her and take her out. She's like, get the fuck off of me. So, you know, she's sitting outside and she's smoking. So then, um, well, I kind of, I kind of got ahead of myself, but um, I'm going to stop right here. Actually, guys, I didn't get ahead of myself. I skipped a scene. So, um, Blanc and Judy were talking about, pray tell, you know, about him not taking his AZ, not getting on AZT and taking it, and how he was losing weight, and, you know, um, Blanc's like, yeah, and he's drinking coffee, trying to keep his energy up, and Electra's like, well, some of us here are trying to pay our respects. And I'm like, bitch, shut up. 
So like I said, um, so Lulu is outside and Candy comes up to talk to her. And you know, um, Lulu, Candy's like, bitch, you know you were stealing some of the shit, taking some of the shit off me that wasn't really yours. And she's like, you know, I respect you. She's like, because everybody else in there, they're not being as honest as you are. Um, and you know, uh, she's like, um, Lulu, Candy says, and you, because because let's be honest, you never really liked me. And then, you know, um, Candy's like, but, so she's like, tell me, when did you ever show me kindness? She's like, I was nothing but an accessory to you. And then she says, um, you know, she says, you were always envious of me because I was light-skinned and thick. And, um, well, she resented her because of that. So then, you know, they just, uh, you know, they're talking, you know, they're talking and, you know, if ultimately, Lulu is going to miss Candy. Despite, even if she didn't like her, they had some stuff in common. They were friends. Yes, friends, you know, go back and forth and bigger, but she's going to miss her when, you know, times get tough. And she's not going to be there beside her to, you know, help her. So, um, then we see, um, in, you know, back in there in the funeral, you know, Candy is on the side of, um, Blanca and she's humming. They're both humming. So then Electra comes in there and she's like, there's some stragglers outside that are, you know, uh, going through the food and, you know, Blanca's like, what do you want me to do? Tell them to leave. So, you know, um, uh, Blanca goes out there where the people are and she sees them. And I'm like, that has to be Candy's parents. And lo and behold, it was Candy's parents. And the mama, the mama was kind of pissing me off just a little bit because Blanca kept referring to Candy as Candy and she. But she was like, that was my son. I'm like, that was your daughter. Correct pronoun. That was your daughter, not your son. You may have given birth to a boy, but your son did not identify as a male. Your son identified as a woman. And your son transitioned from a man to a woman. So that was your daughter. So, you know, Blanca tells him, well, um, you, you guys can come in and you guys can say your goodbyes. Like, come with me. So they do go in there. So we see them up there by the body. And the mom, the mama, we hear Candy talking to her. So, you know, Candy, Candy, as a child, she thought that her mom accepted her because she saw her in her Revlon stuff. But when her mom disowned her, basically, she just felt a type of way about that. And it's so funny how with both of her parents, it took for them to, um, took death for them to finally see who Candy really is. And her mom says, you know, she just, she thought she was just, you know, creative and at worst gay. And I'm like, at worst gay? I'm like, damn, that's, that's bad. Whew. So then, you know, Candy talks to her dad. And it sounds like her dad might have been more accepting than her mom was, which I find it kind of interesting. You know, and her dad was talking about how, you know, she couldn't really throw a football, but damn, damn it, she knew how to tackle. And, you know, um, I, he, you know, he was talking about how Candy asked for a dollhouse. She asked for it two years in a row. And, you know, he got it for, she got it for Christmas. She said that was the best Christmas ever. And, um, you know, she said, you know, she would pretend like she was asleep. But she would see her dad come into the room and, you know, put the um, dollhouse together for her. Um, what else? Okay, so then pray tell, um, you know, he gets up and he says, you know, we're going to announce this at the ball, but we're going to announce it here. So, you know, um, in honor of Miss Candy, we are going to create a new um, category and the category will be called Candy Sweet Refrain. So then the, um, the ceremony ends and we see where they take the casket out and they wheel it to the ballroom. And at the ballroom, they're doing a lip sync and Candy is being praised and the judges are giving her all tens. And I'm like, wow, what a way to send her off. So then they have the final dinner and you know, um, Blanca asks Pray Tell to give the toast and he toasts, you know, to Candy. So, um, you know, everybody has left to go to the, the kids have left to go to the club. So, you know, um, uh, Blanc and Praytel, they cleaning the dishes. And, you know, Praytel says, here, put some water in this glass for me. She was like, it's already, she's like, here, he was like, he gave her the glass. She's like, it's already clean. He was like, no, put some water in there for me. She was like, okay, what for? So then he goes into his pocket and he pulls out the AZT pills. She was like, when did you get those? He said, I, you know, after the funeral, 
he got them from um, Judy because, you know, he said he was looking at the kids and he, he just doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to live his life with, um, well, he doesn't want to die, put it that way. He doesn't want to die with anything unsaid. He doesn't want to die with any kind of regrets. So anything that he can do to prolong his life, he wants to do it. And I'm like, there, I'm like, there you go. That's what you need to do. Yes, that AZT pill might not be the best, but if it can prolong your life, go forward and do it. So, you guys, that was the episode. Like I said, it was a it was a heavy, heavy episode. But like the video, leave your comments, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you guys later.